Hello, and welcome to another edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read-Along. Our guest this week is David Gellis, climate reporter and former corner office columnist for the New York Times. He's the author of a new book on Jack Welch, The Man Who Broke Capitalism. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan, the managing director for ASU's Cronkite School of Journalism's Cronkite Pro, and co-founder of DigiMentors, a digital and virtual events consultancy. My name is Neil Parekh. I am the executive producer of Sri Sunday New York Times Read Along and the occasional guest host. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our DigiMentors website. Thank you to everyone who is watching this on replay uh, for, for joining us after the fact. Uh, we encourage you to like, comment, share, retweet, tag your friends. Let them know about the great show we're about to have uh, this week with David Gellis. Uh, to give you a bit of a preview of what's to come, we want to uh, show you a little bit of a teaser video. And after that, we'll uh, welcome some of the folks who are watching the show. Our guest on this week's edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along is David Gellis, a correspondent on the climate desk at the New York Times, covering the intersection of public policy and the private sector. Before joining the climate team, David spent eight years as a reporter for the business section, covering CEOs, tech, media, Wall Street, and more. David was the corner office columnist for the past four years and previously worked with the Well Team to expand the Times' coverage of meditation. He is the author of The Man Who Broke Capitalism, How Jack Welch Gutted the Heartland and Crushed the Soul of Corporate America, and How to Undo His Legacy. The book reveals the legendary CEO of GE to be the root of all that's wrong with capitalism today, offers advice on how we might right those wrongs, and demonstrates how his approach to business led to the greatest socioeconomic inequality since the Great Depression. It also highlights companies and leaders who have abandoned Welchism, for example, PayPal and Unilever. We will also look at a special report in the New York Times Metro section about efforts to transform New York area airports. Sri Srinivasan is our host. I am the executive producer and occasional guest host, Neil Parrett. Paula Kiger helps produce the show, engaging with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. Sri has been hosting the New York Times Read Along for six and a half years with some amazing guests. The show is produced by Digimentors. We produce high quality virtual and hybrid events for organizations big and small around the world. We also do social and digital consulting, training, and workshops. Again, David Gellis is our guest, live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. That gives you a little bit of a preview of what's to come. We're going to be covering, of course, uh, David's book on Jack Welch, The Man Who Broke Capitalism. Uh, we'll be talking about his work on the business desk, uh, particularly his corner office uh, um, columns, which I thought were incredible. We also He also has a background in meditation, uh, and he's written a book on that as well. Currently, he's on the climate desk. There are just so many great topics that we'll be looking at with David in uh, just a short while. But first, let's say hi to some of the folks who are joining us uh, today. My mom. Hi, mom. How you doing? Uh, from uh, Hastings on Hudson. And yes, it is hot uh, in uh, the U.S., uh, around the country. A lot of places seeing triple digit uh, weather. Europe is hot as well. Uh, Perfect uh, topic to talk to David about. Uh, Patricia is joining us uh, from Ro uh, Long Island. Uh, thank you, uh, Patricia. Always great to see you. Linda Lawrence, uh, stay hydrated and cool today. Absolutely. Diane Stefani watching from Margate, New Jersey. Thank you, uh, Diane. 
Doug Levy joining us, waking up early uh, as usual from the Bay Area. Um, and he's saying fascinating reporting in David's uh, book. Renee Edelman, a great friend of ours, a great friend of the show. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Renee, uh, and appreciated your tweet. She's joining from Chicago. And uh, Renu is joining us as well from Denver. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to bring on Sri Srinivasan. Uh, Sri, good morning. How are you? Morning. Uh, this is such an important conversation we're going to have with David Gellis. I'm so excited about that. Uh, thank you, Neil, for all you do to produce the show with our friend Paula Kiger. Uh, we are with so much to talk about today, and uh, we are so grateful to everyone watching from around the world. Please tell us where you're watching from. Please tell us about your Sunday and tell us uh, if you have any questions for David to talk about climate, talk about Jack Welch, to talk about uh, meditation. He's done so many interesting things and he's doing fantastic work at the New York Times. Uh, Doug Levy says, I, would, I, I won't rub it in that it was so cold this past evening that I had to put an extra <laughs> blanket on my bed in the Bay Area. Uh, Ted Coltman is watching from Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome, Ted. And Paula says, good morning from Daytona Beach, Florida, where I'm visiting my son and daughter-in-law. Folks, tag a friend, retweet, share. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We do this on Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And it's a wonderful chance to talk about the news, to talk about accurate information, and to get your thoughts on various things going on in the news. What we're gonna do is before we bring David on is we're gonna look at the newspaper and just show you some of the front pages of the various sections and then we will bring David on. So uh, let's get started with that. And uh, here we go with the Sunday New York Times uh, print edition. And one of the things we do here is celebrate print and not just the New York Times, but all newspapers. Uh, the front section, the very front page, A1, we will look at with uh, David closely, but the, just so you know the headlines in Georgia, case involving Trump casts broad net. It's the 2020 election inquiry. And then the big photo and story, last stand at the steelworks inside an 80-day siege in Ukraine with the war still going on there. And women face public vitriol for testimony. And here you see, what is justice? One Parkland family's journey. Health officials call emergency for monkeypox. And many of us remember when COVID became an official pandemic. This is now not at that level yet, but there are only two diseases that are used, have this description right now. And that is COVID-19 and polio. And an explosion of digital comics find a new, finds a new world of readers, and it's about women uh, readers of web comics and how they, the viewership has exploded. Here is the Sunday business cover is a battered economy's bright spot flickers. Ukraine's tech companies are thriving at the moment, but war puts foreign contracts at risk and build houses even if no one is buying right now. And the Sunday business section was David's home as the corner office columnist for so many years. Here is the Sunday Styles cover, a taste for cannibalism. Stomach churning books, films, and TV shows have captured imaginations. And he's a guide in the shadows. Will Malatek, perhaps the last movie rental clerk in New York, operates film noir cinema. So I didn't know there were still those available. Uh, the Metropolitan cover is about LaGuardia, JFK, and Newark, and how the airports in New York have long been a mess, and how that's changing. If you haven't been to the LaGuardia terminal, the new terminal that they've made, uh, you will be really impressed and a big difference from the old LaGuardia. The Sunday Opinion cover is I Was Wrong. Eight Times Opinion columnists re revisit their incorrect predictions and bad advice and reflect on why they changed their minds. I remember seeing, I read a couple of these, including Paul Krugman said that he was wrong about inflation. Arts and Leisure cover is the anti-hero's last gasp. With definitions of truth and justice now seemingly up for grabs, what purpose do the figures who tow the line between good and evil still serve? It's a fascinating question. And the New York Times Magazine cover is Stop the Steal. Uh, how the movement to reinstate President Trump has gone far beyond him 
and now threatens the future of American elections. And this is a point that uh, we've made multiple times in our newsletter, uh, which I hope you all subscribe to, srinet.substack.com, srinet.substack.com, that the GOP has gone way beyond just Trump and, uh, and in some cases have gone beyond even some of the things that he was advocating. And the book review cover is Dark Matter. So we already a couple of dark themes in the time section today. And the real estate cover is sit down, let's talk about this. Conversation pits make a resurgence. This is where we come together and bond. All right. So this is what you're seeing in some homes and maybe apartment areas and things like that. The conversation pit. Okay. So with that, we are very excited to talk about everything in the news with our friend David Gellis. We are so excited to have him here today. He's climate reporter and former corner office columnist of the New York Times, the author of a new book on Jack Welch, The Man Who Broke Capitalism. And uh, please welcome with us here today, David. Hi there. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We always start by asking how you're doing and where you are today. I'm, I'm good. You, I, I, I saw that picture of me, my Times headshot, and you're obviously getting like summer David at his mother-in-law's beach house. So that's the version of me you're getting this morning. Uh, I'm in New Hampshire on a lake uh, at my mother-in-law's place, and I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Well, that sounds wonderful. Uh, are you a Sunday morning person or a morning person at all? Uh, I've, I have to be a morning person because I have two children and a dog. So I think before I had kids and a dog, I was not a morning person, but I very much am now. Yeah, that sounds familiar to me. My twins are now 19, but I changed my habits 19 years ago exactly. when, when they were born. So uh, we, we are just so grateful that you would spend part of your Sunday with us. Everyone, please follow David on Twitter. He's at D Gellis, G-E-L-L-E-S on Twitter. And please check out his book, which he's going to tell us all about in just a moment. There it is, The Man Who Broke Capitalism, a book about Jack Welch, uh, someone who has been praised and lauded for the most of his business life and certainly towards the end there and you stepped up and wrote a book that went against the grain so to talk about the book the genesis of it and uh, how it all came about yeah well thanks again for having me uh the genesis really sort of has two critical moments the first was sort of a slow burn and it happened during those years when i was writing the corner office column and in, in interview after interview, in, in including some of the ones that I even saw on the screen, Jack Welch's name would come up. And he still, I realized after you know, years of talking to CEOs over the last you know, five years or so, he still occupied this place of prominence in the minds of today's corporate leaders. And that just bugged me, right? That was like reporters get a question or sort of an observation that sort of gnaws away at them and they don't quite know what to do with. This was one of those for me. Why is this man who's been retired for 15, 16, 17 years at this point, who's no longer really a figure on the national page, still retain this place of prominence? That was a question that was bugging me. And then I became one of the two reporters at the Times, along with my colleague, Natalie Kitroeff, who led our coverage of Boeing in the aftermath of the two 737 MAX crashes from March of 2019 to March of 2020. And in the course of reporting that story, we very quickly discovered that while there was an engineering story that explained why the two planes had tragically crashed, there was also this deeper cultural story that showed how Boeing had lost its way, how a company that had been so focused on exceptional aeronautical engineering for most of the 20th century somehow went astray and went adrift and lost its bearings. And when we started digging into that story, it was the story of Jack Welch. And I talk in the book about sort of some seminal moments in that evolution, which I won't go into now, but there were these moments where I was like, oh my gosh, the Boeing story is actually a Jack Welch story. And Jack Welch is the guy that's still rent free in the minds of all of today's CEOs. And then it was really a month into the pandemic when I was sort of twiddling my thumbs in my kitchen one night, wondering what I was going to do with my life. that I was like, oh, maybe I'll write a book bringing these two things together. And that's how it happened. 
Well, it's so timely given everything that's going on. The discussion of late stage capitalism is something mm -hmm. that has caught fire in so many areas, including, you know, uh, news stories, but also kind of fiction, television, everybody's talking about that. So uh, what are some of the things you learned along the way and what surprised mm -hmm. you as you reported on this? For those who are not in business, you know, as you said, he is so revered. He is considered the greatest CEO by so many people, including folks you interviewed, including very successful CEOs. So getting uh, to a point where you're able to show how many things he was responsible for that are not just the things that are praiseworthy. Yeah, well, and just to level set for anyone on the call who doesn't know who Jack Welch was, just I'll say it as briefly as I can. He was the CEO of General Electric from 1981 to 2001. And while General Electric is sort of a shell of what it once was, it's important to understand that during those years and when he took it over, this was really the most influential, important company in the country. And that for basically a century, this co company, which had been founded by Thomas Edison, of course, and sort of brought into the modern, brought us into the modern age with light bulbs and refrigerators and radios and jet engines and power plants and all these things, was also the company that sort of set the tone for the rest of corporate America. So he was the most important CEO at the most important company at during these two decades that sort of reshaped the modern economy and brought us from the post-war era into this, you know, call it what you will today. So that's just who he was. In terms of what surprised me, I mean, listen, I, I obviously have a pretty uh, sharp point of view, which is right there on the cover of the book. And that was that was generally my thesis going in. And one of the things that surprised me, so so you know, I I wasn't surprised in that my thesis was sort of like contradicted in the reporting. It, to the contrary, what surprised me was the the degree to which I kept finding his fingerprints all over the economy in more and more unexpected places. And when I started like pulling on a thread, like his relationship with Donald Trump, for example, all of a sudden there was this whole universe of ways, both sort of overt and more subtle, in which the two of these men were like peas in a pod. And so the, the thing that surprised me was just how pervasive his influence ultimately was, not just on the business world, but on American culture as well. And we are all living in the with with the with the results of everything that he touched. Give us some examples of of uh, things that he touched that we are now experiencing, good or bad. Oh, I mean, the list goes on. Listen, his disciples are still running major American companies. So David Zaslav, the CEO of Time Warner Discovery, he was a Jack Welch lieutenant. Dave Calhoun, the CEO of Boeing who I interviewed, you know, in person at the very start of the pandemic and who gave us this very unhinged interview. I don't know if we can find that, but it's, uh, you know, it's an interview that Natalie and I did with Dave Calhoun uh, in March. It was like March 2nd of 2020. And he gave us this very, very sort of, un, I don't know how else to say it, sort of an unhinged interview where he talked about how terrible Boeing, the company he was now leading, was. He threw his predecessor, Den Dennis Mullenberg, under the bus saying he like was chasing this pot of gold, chasing the pot of gold for stock over the rainbow or some like completely convoluted mixed metaphor. And then the next day, when he has to do damage control with his board and he has to explain what the heck happened, why he gave this crazy interview, he says, well, it's because Jack Welch, who he described in that interview as his forever mentor had died the day before. And he was so upset, so shaken that he sort of lost control in the moment and, and sort of wasn't aware of all the things he was saying. That's what he told his board in a memo that we saw. Um, so I, I feel like I may have lost uh, the original question because it's Sunday morning. I'm just on my first cup of coffee. Um, it, other fingerprints of his, so his CEOs are still in charge. When we see these, you know, I think the biggest influence Welch had, and, and, and it's, it's not just one thing, but it's sort of a whole way of being, it's a way of thinking, is the argument I make, and, and back up with evidence, is that Welch was the one that, that made real 
the Milton Friedman doctrine, which of course appeared in the New York Times Sunday magazine in 1971, that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits, right? For 10 years, that sort of, that, that thesis hung out there, essentially unacted upon for, for 10 years until Welch came along in 1981 and actually made good on that promise. By doing so, by Jack Welch doing so at GE, and having so much success, and we got to give him credit for the success he had on, you know, on the terms he he chose to play. Um, the rest of the con country and the rest of the economy really went along for the ride. And so this sort of share world of shareholder primacy, which I think defines the corporate behavior of so many companies, is is all the legacy of Jack Welch. He was the one that essentially gave permission to CEOs to act in the interest of shareholders and investors at any cost to the at the expense of all other stakeholders. And, and so when we see things like companies resorting to mass layoffs at the first glimmer of potentially weak earnings, when we see companies, you know, using $10 billion in free cash flow on share buybacks and dividends instead of taking care of their people and investing in R&D and CapEx. When we see like yet another round of outsourcing and offshoring, all of this is the legacy of Jack Welch. And that particular idea that the shareholders must get, you know, the most important part of a business enterprise right. is, as you're saying, was made so important by Jack Welch, he elevated uh, that uh, that original idea. In 2019, a group of business folks came together and promised to change that. Can you tell us what happened with that uh, in the last couple of years? Yeah, I'm very familiar with it because I wrote the front page story about it. If someone wants to find it, it is the August 2019 story on the business roundtable. I think I shared the byline with David Yaffe Bellamy who was an intern at the time, who's now back with the paper full-time after a stint at Bloomberg. And that was his first page one too. So uh, we always remember that one together. And listen, that was the 2019 proclamation by the Business Roundtable, which is this group of CEOs that um, they had redefined the purpose of the corporation. Yeah, shareholder value is no longer everything, top CEOs say. Uh, I, I, I remember like, where I was when I wrote all these stories. Um, I, I don't know if I don't know if all reporters have that, but especially like ones that land on the front. I sort of I wrote this one in a Starbucks in the Hudson Valley because that's just like where I happened to be that day. I remember sitting down like, okay, here we go. Um, well, I remember reading this and saying, my God, if this is even remotely true, this would be big. But as you will tell us, yeah, well, yeah, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, so, so this is this influential group of CEOs. They said shareholder value is no longer everything. They're going to take care of all stakeholders. Uh, but they gave very few specifics. There was absolutely no accountability. They gave no metrics on which they were going to hold themselves accountable. And lo and behold, when in just a matter of months later, the pandemic hit, many of the companies that signed this statement studies found were more likely to lay off workers than those who hadn't signed this statement, which to me just, you know, gives lie to the fact that like corporate America has had some great philosophical awakening. Um, now, listen, as, as, as I point out in the book, and as we can talk about when the time is right, there are some companies that are doing some things somewhat differently, but on balance, I think we've still got a very long way to go. And we are, in fact, living through the impact of all of this. And uh, of course, uh, officials will say that it's because of the pandemic. But as you said, if the people who signed this are more likely to, you know, to break their own pledges, that should that tells you something is very wrong, folks. This is David Gellis. Uh, he is the New York Times climate reporter and a former columnist of the Corner Office, which is a wonderful. A collection of interviews that he did, and I want to hear about some of his uh, favorite interviews. Uh, but here we are talking also about his book that uh, is uh, looking at Jack Welch and showing people that he was very different from all the praise that you hear constantly uh, about him. And this idea, David, that uh, the own the people who run companies should be paid so many times 
more than the average employee. That also changed in part because of Jack. He, he was at, at the leading edge of so many of these fundamental transformations in the way people are rewarded and compensated and who, who benefits from the tremendous wealth creation that our economy produces. Uh, you look at things like executive compensation that you say, stock-based compensation, you look at buybacks, uh, share buybacks, you look at the taxes that GE paid and their efforts to reduce the amount of taxes they paid the IRS. Time and again, Jack Welch and GE were really at the vanguard of some of these fundamental transformations to our economy. And yeah, Welch, listen, he was not an inventor. He was not a founder. And a lot of people like to liken him to like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. But, you know, for all their faults, perhaps, both those men founded companies, multiple companies that have had tremendous impact. Jack Welch never founded anything. He was a, he was a paid manager and he was made a billionaire for it. OK, he was on the Forbes 400 list of the richest Americans in the country for being a people manager. And, and this is really where I start the book is sort of a question, a, a meditation on why it is we elevate our CEOs to these places of such moral authority. Right. Why do we treat the people in our society who have the most money as the most gifted and the most talented? and the most virtuous and the wisest among us all, right? We look to our CEOs for guidance on moral and cultural and religious issues now. You know, and, and that's something I'd covered extensively at the Times for the last seven years. And it's all crazy to me. And you, you started this question with how much money they make. I mean, I think it's unconscionable that the CEO of Walmart makes a thousand times what his median worker does. You know, that, that to me is, is, is injustice manifest. And, and, and I don't see any other way to say it. And, and of you, course, you, the... let, me, let me just, let me add one thing. Like, I know we're here to talk about the Times, but I think it's on the, the main Press Herald, the Press Herald today. I don't know if anyone saw this. And I think it was Ellen Berry, maybe, who retweeted this, who's one of our correspondents, of course. It's a stunning story. Here, here we go. Okay. Um, uh, oh, now I'm, I, I got my phone off Wi-Fi. I'll pull it up. But I think it's in the, the Press Herald, which I believe is a main paper. And, and it's a story about, here we go. Okay, yeah. Ellen Berry, Times reporter, tweeted Press Herald story. Nobody would choose this. Find that and share that link. And like, this is the portrait of America. And we do these portraits too, but I'm so grateful to see local papers doing it too. Where there are these people who work, right? Who work their whole lives and can't pay rent when they're in their 60s and 70s. Okay, and this is the consequence of the Jack Welch economy. This is an economy where companies don't take care of our fellow citizens. And it's, it's wrecked our country. The inequality that we're seeing, and that's, this is a, you know, a stark example of it is, uh, something that's so pervasive now. And the fact that you have been able to uh, show the influence of Jack Welch is really so important. Uh, tell us about the the way you were able to sell the book to your publisher and others. As I said, there is this community of people who love Jack. So was it hard to get uh, get this, uh, get buy-in for a book? It's one thing for you to report it and write it. It's another for to get buy-in. Uh, yeah, there. I'm trying to think what I what I should and can say. <laughs> People who know me can find me, and I'll tell them the real story over a beer. But I'm not going to tell it in public right now, at least. Um, the upshot The upshot is that I have a tremendous agent in Amanda Urban, who, uh, when I mentioned the idea, was intrigued right away. And that I was very fortunate to land with Eamon Dolan, who's one of the best editors in the business, who's now at Simon & Schuster and was the editor of my first book as well, and who also got it right away. And, uh, and we were off to the races. You know, it was a tremendously quick turnaround. I, as I said, I had the idea in April of 2020, and it was published in May of 2022, which, you know, is, is 
very fast from idea to pub day. And if I had the idea in April 2020, the, the, the proposal wasn't out until August of 2020. And I didn't have a signed contract until like October or November of that year. So we're talking, you know, essentially something close to 18 months from signed contract to pub day, which is really fast in the industry. Here's Jennifer Taub's uh, uh, blurb. It says a provocative page turner that exposes the dark truths about Jack Welch, America's first celebrity CEO. After building a sprawling global empire through unmanageable merger, shady accounting, and heartless downsizing with undue veneration and countless imitators, it's good to see Welch finally cut down to size. Uh, tell us a little bit, and here Ariana Huffington also had a lot of positive uh, things to say, including a must read for anyone who wants to say goodbye forever to a toxic chapter of American capitalism. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what are the things that people will learn in this book or the things that would uh, surprise them because, you know, they don't follow it as strongly or as carefully as you do, this whole uh, kind of era that we live in? Yeah, well, we've touched on some of it already. And, and one thing I do want to emphasize is as much as this is clearly a book about a man, um, I really try to make it a book about a system, right? Jack had his faults. He also had his virtues, which I touch on in the book. But at the end of the day, he was really this bridge between the previous economy and the one we live in today. And he was the one that sort of pulled us from one era to the next. And again, you know, like, I, I touch on some of his, uh, you know, personal foibles, some of the salacious stuff that happened when he was CEO, his divorce, which made the headlines. But it's not where I try to spend most of my energy. You know, the thing that I really want people to take away from this book is that the unjust economy we live in today, like the scenes like the one we just looked at in that, in, in that story from the Press Herald, it doesn't have to be like this. And it wasn't always like this, right? Like this economy is the product of a series of decisions that mostly men who run companies have made about how the wealth created by our corporations is distributed in this society. And this is where it's gotten us. But it literally does not have to be this way. And in fact, it wasn't always this way. Wealth used to be much distributed in a much more equitable fashion, including at companies like GE, which I cite extensively. And so as we think about how we're going to sort of shape our economy for the next 40 decades, 40 years, I, I hope we can look to stories like this as inspiration. Can you give us a couple of specific examples of, you know, of fuel? Okay. Can you give us a couple of specific examples of where the you know where that fork in the road was and decisions that were made that caused us to go in one direction and end up here? And so what would the alt history look like for capitalism? Yeah, I mean, we touched on one of them earlier. I mean, we mentioned soaring CEO pay, but of course that's relative to worker pay. You know, CEO pay goes up by 13 or 16 percent annually. Worker pay has, at least until the, the recent sort of labor upheavals, it's, it's effectively remained flat for decades. Like the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. If it had simply kept pace with inflation since the moment Jack Welch was named C CEO, it would be closer to $30 an hour at this wow. point. Wow. Okay? So workers are getting, have been taking a pay cut every single year. And that is the result of choices made by CEOs who have decided they can get away with paying their workers less. While at the same time, taking more and more of the money for themselves. It's like, it's just not that complicated. Like the, the CEOs and the directors that run our biggest companies have decided that they are going to create a more unequal society. And they succeeded in doing that. No, oh, mainly because they were benefiting themselves, obviously. But are, are there, and I know a lot of this also permeated internationally, are there systems that are working for both workers and the economy and for businesses that are better than this? 
Yeah, I don't know. The, the answer is I don't know the specifics of uh, income distribution in the Nordic countries, for example. What I do know is that we were outliers in America in all uh, of the wrong ways, for, you know, in, in so many of these arenas. We have some of the highest inequality. I mean, of course, you have strident inequality in, in parts of the developing world. Um, but in many of the developed nations, uh, it's clear that w we have Hi, folks. Well, we're just making sure that uh, David's uh, Wi-Fi is working. Let's meanwhile say hello to some folks. Eric Sharfstein is watching from Ottawa. Amy is watching from Connecticut and is reading David's book right now. Thank you. And everyone, please get David's book. Uh, Stefan's watching from Ramsey, New Jersey, New York Times read along family. And Ellen's watching from the Upper East Side. Uh, welcome, everybody. Please hit share right now, whatever platform you're on. Folks can watch right away on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. As soon as this is over, the show will play again. Therese is watching from Yonkers and Chris Gorman from New York City. So tell us, folks, uh, share your questions and comments about what's happening. David uh, Clint says, big fan of David's work and the climate team in general. I'm wondering how much climate coverage becomes uh, a full vertical at the New York Times. And we will get to talking about David's work in the climate desk. And Rose is watching such interesting conversation of why David uh, came to write this book. And that's so important. I'm going to jump in. It's three. I think we lost our audio. Uh, if you can, um, uh, we'll, we'll uh, get back to three in just a moment. David, right. we have you back, I think. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't go anywhere, do. but, but uh, you might not have been able to see me. We, All right. We lost you for, for just a bit. So, but, but thank you very much. Again, a great conversation, uh, some great insights about Jack Welch as uh, Sri started off the conversation, someone who is, you know, really lauded by uh, CEOs and, and B schools. Uh, but there's this undercurrent and, you know, you pull no punches uh, in your in your book and your commentary. So we really appreciate it. Uh, we want to talk a little bit uh, about some of the other work that you've done as well. Um, and uh, specifically, you know, let's let's go back kind of more chronologically. Mm. Um, you you have practiced meditation for a number of years. You went to India, I think it was, yep. um, and uh, practiced there. And you wrote about it. And you wrote about the nexus between uh, how meditation is being used in uh, corporate America. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, as you mentioned, I began studying uh, and practicing Buddhism uh, when I was in my late teens, I guess. And then spent my junior year of India in India, um, both studying academically, but also sort of getting deeper into practice and meditation practice and going on, you know, multi-week silent meditation retreats. And that just became a big part of my life and was sort of a private part of my life uh, until I was at the Financial Times. And I guess it's 2013 around this point. And so for 15 years or so, I had been meditating privately. Um, and then... I remember where I was. Again, I, there are these moments where they sort of become movie moments, but I was sitting in the FT newsroom in New York City and I was looking at the Bloomberg terminal for something else. And I saw just one of these weird Bloomberg tickers that said something about, you know, General Mills teaching meditation. And it was like an AP wire story. And I was like, what the heck? And I looked into it. And sure enough, there was like a meditation group that was out in the open at General Mills. I went there, I sat with them, I started investigating it. And what I found was this whole world of sort of secular Buddhist meditation taking place across corporate America. That became the uh, basis for a uh, cover story for the FT Weekend magazine that then became my book proposal um, and my first book, Mindful Work, How Meditation is Changing Business from the Inside Out, which I think was published in 2015. And, and then you also, you wrote about meditation for the New York Times. You wrote a whole column uh, on uh, how to be mindful at various tasks. We'll bring that up in just a second as I hand it back to Sri, uh, who is, uh, who's back with us. Sri? Hi. Here you go. We're talking about meditation. We moved on to meditation. Um, 
Sorry about that. Uh, tech, uh, tech fun is always part of the new world, isn't it, David? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you were telling us about your meditation work. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, well, I just sort of gave the history of the book. And then at the times, I've done a handful of meditation content. Um, the column was sort of whimsical and fun. The, the, the uh, meditation for real life column, which ran for, I don't know, a year or two in the well section. What, what I would encourage you to pull up if you can, which has had a real long shelf life, is a series of guides I produced about um, how to meditate. So if you Google how to meditate, I think one of the first things that comes up is my guide for the New York Times. I did mindfulness for children. And I think we did one for the workplace as well, how to be mindful at work. I think all three of those uh, were part of this series of guides that the Times did um, and have had really long shelf lives, especially the, the how to meditate one. Uh, both that and the mindfulness for children continue to sort of get resurfaced years after I produced them and have just these really long shelf lives. And, you know, we, we can talk about, there it is. Um, we can talk about, you know, the, the content itself, but I think just for, 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 for times aficionados, it's also a really good example of the way in which the paper is producing more evergreen content um, that has, you know, is, is not tied to a specific news cycle or, or a sort of moment in the zeitgeist but that can be useful to readers for, for years and years. That's fantastic. And folks, uh, please look it up and please uh, take a look at the, uh, the pieces, the guides that he, he wrote. And uh, of course, mindfulness is having a moment now and so many people are uh, practicing it and doing it. Uh, are you surprised about how that has come about? Uh, I guess not really. Um, you know, just, I, I know too much about, about this world. So, uh, if anything, um, if anything, I'm, I'm a little surprised that it, it hasn't gotten, ah, maybe it has gotten big, right? We see calm and headspace and some of these apps are worth a billion dollars now. And LeBron James is like a celebrity endorser. So yeah, listen, I, it's out there. So I'm not surprised, but it's, it's just, you know, in the same way that I wasn't surprised when I said, sort of got the Jack Welch thing in my head and then started seeing it everywhere. Same thing. Like I sort of spotted mindfulness as sort of an undercurrent in, in, in the zeitgeist uh, some years ago. And so I'm not terribly surprised when it, when it keeps popping up. Yeah. The, there's the book, uh, how meditation is changing business from the inside out. Mindful work is the title of the book and uh, a celebrity CEO uh, gave <laughs> you a good, blurb there. So uh, we you had said that there are CEOs and companies that are doing it right in terms of dealing with uh, the various issues we've been talking about. So do you want to give us some examples? Yeah, I don't know if I said anyone was doing it right. I think so, I, I think uh, I'll summarize myself by saying some were doing it less bad in some areas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we shouldn't be laughing, but it's, uh, it's yeah, I'm careful not to give too much credit. Listen, uh, <laughs> there's so much work to be done and, and and things have gotten so out of whack that I think it's important when some CEOs and companies do do things differently and do try to, you know, take better care of their employees and their communities. It's really important to notice that and, and to take note of it and to you know pot potentially celebrate it. But it's also in the same breath, it, critical that we don't uh, overstate the impact that one company can have or that the impact that one action can have when a lot of other things that company might be doing are, are you know, sort of pushing things in the other direction. So all that being said, yeah, in the book, I, I call out two companies in particular and give them sort of a, a, a pretty good hearing. Uh, the first was Unilever, which was this big multinational food and consumer goods company that under the leadership of Paul Pullman for 10 years, quite recently, uh, really tried to uproot a lot of the practices of what I described as Welch's, right? He came in and he immediately abolished giving quarterly earnings guidance to sort of take the short-term pressure off. He believed that would allow him to make longer-term decisions in the better, in best interest of all the stakeholders. He cleaned the supply chain. He started taking better care of work. Goes on. The other company I really give heed to is PayPal, which again, you know, big tech company. I'm sure there's there's lots of things I'm sure PayPal could be doing better. However, a few years ago, the CEO Dan Schulman asked the question that I invite all CEOs to ask, which is, what are the lives 
of the people at my company who make the least amount of money really like? And really answering that question is not always very comfortable for CEOs. Because in the case of Dan Shulman, he said, okay, what's it like for my call center workers who live in Phoenix, and Arizona and make less than $20 an hour? And guess what? Like, they were making well above the minimum wage. They were probably making more than the average wage compared to the competitors. But none of that means anything when everyone has been systematically underpaying people for decades. And in the case of PayPal, Dan told me, he's like, I learned that my employees were choosing between gas money and textbooks for their kids. They were choosing between Christmas presents and health insurance. And, and that was madness. You know, PayPal throws off billions of dollars of profits every year. And Dan, kudos to him for asking that question and then double kudos for doing something about it. Gave everyone a raise, gave everyone stock, rolled out a financial literacy program, and then critically said, I'll eat, I think it was roughly 30% of your healthcare costs. We just started to take, even reduce their healthcare bills by 30%. And that's the kind of stuff. And like, whoa, you just transformed the lives of all those people and their families made a huge impact. Yes, it costs some money, but PayPal makes so much money. Like, it, was it material? Probably technically, yes. Did it like wildly throw them off course? No, they have plenty of money still. Not only that, like net promoter score went up, customers were happier, retention costs went down, turnover went down, morale at the company went up. Like, so this false dichotomy that if you take good care of your people, you're somehow not taking care of your shareholders is one of these myths, it's this lie that has been told and like foisted on the economy for decades now. And, and I can't emphasize the degree to which so much human suffering will be alleviated if we, if we get past it and see through it and, and stop thinking of it as an either or situation and realize that there is enough for investors to make a good return and to take care of our people as well. That's so well put. And of course, PayPal is a company that also gave us Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, who are the CEOs in that Jack Welch mode and uh, celebrated uh, for many of the wrong reasons. Uh, we do have to ask you about Elon Musk. Uh, tell us about what he, in what ways is he a beneficiary of all the Jack Welch things that uh, Jack did? Yeah, well, in the, the first serial, which is the first excerpt of the book, uh, that appeared in the Times like a week and a half before the book was published. I think it's called How Jack Welch's Reign at GE Gave Us Elon Musk's Twitter Feed, which is a brilliant headline by the uh, inimitable Sunday business editor, Rachel Dry, an, an absolute master of sort of tapping into the zeitgeist. And um, I do draw a direct line there, of course. And, but But I don't want to make too much of it. The point I'm making there is that uh, Welch, who late in life, starting around 2012, became really a sort of an unhinged character on Twitter and started disseminating lies, misinformation about the Obama administration, you know, a la, you know, in line with Trump's birtherism at the very same moment, um, set the precedent for this new, brash, uninhibited, CEO on Twitter. So that's one of the ways, yes. And you can see more recent uh, examples of sort of Welch Musk likenesses when it comes to, I feel like it was a month or so ago, Elon said like, I'm having bad vibes about the economy, so I'm gonna lay off 10% of Tesla's workforce. Like, well, okay, <laughs> but just your bad vibes. And of course, Welch uh, was the progenitor of stack ranking this brutal edict that forced companies and managers to fire 10 percent of their workers every single year so yes you can find points of comparison all that said as i mentioned earlier like jack welch was not a builder and for all of musk's problems and faults and whatever you want to make of him he is a titanic builder a world historical figure who has brought into being you know two three four utterly consequential companies, you know, PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX, and Starlink, it changed the world, like, like him or not, like it or not, those are tremendously impactful corporations 
that I think are still going to have a huge amount of influence beyond what they already have today. Thank you. Uh, we do, before we get to the paper itself, I want to ask you about your new beat, mm -hmm. about uh, being a climate reporter. What does that mean exactly? And how do you fit into the overall coverage? There was a question earlier from David Clinch about uh, the emphasis on the on climate change at the at the times. Uh, absolutely. So earlier this year, I forget, it was February or March, uh, I left the business desk, I joined the climate desk. And the climate desk, I mean, to sort of answer his question somewhat directly is is its own vertical. That's, you know, I think it is. I don't exactly know how they, you know, what be, is and isn't a vertical. We don't obviously have our own section of the print paper. But there is a climate editor in Hannah Fairfield, and she has deputies, and we are sort of our own desk, which is great. Um, and it speaks to the commitment Dean had to climate coverage, which I think is something he really came into his focus in a serious way several years ago. And I think Joe, by all accounts, is equally committed to understanding climate as one of the defining issues, one of the defining stories. Of, of not only you know this year and last year, but I think you know looking ahead, I think there's a few meta stories, um, and this is not this is not uh, masthead gospel that I'm disseminating, but but this is just my own sort of reading of the tea leaves. I think we've got like a few meta trends that are going to shape coverage and shape the world in the years ahead, which is climate is one. Start there. Uh, I think you know the fight for democracy, the future of democracy in the U.S. and abroad is another. Um, the pandemic, obviously, no one quite saw it coming, but it's here. And so the pandemic and global health uh, seems to be another one that is not leaving us anytime soon. And then obviously the war and the fallout. So, you know, so much of what we cover. Um, and, you know, listen, within that, I think uh, there is there is the, the, the reckoning over historic systemic racism in this country as well. That, that clearly is another. So, but, but of, you know, Climate fits in with those major coverage areas that are, are, are churning out its whole vein of news coverage and are also a prism through which we can see so many other developments in the world. Um, so again, I joined the team earlier, it's a growing team. We just, I think this week, announced that Max Birek uh, from the Washington Post, who's been, I believe, in Ukraine covering the war for the Post, is joining us to cover international climate policies. So this is a growing team that the company is devoting resources to. We've got a tremendous graphics department. Um, and there's my most recent story, which was on the front page on Tuesday, I believe. Um, and, and, and I think speaks to the sort of the range of coverage that, that we're doing and I'm doing. You know, this is a sort of uh, a, a, a lyrical feature that I reported from Spain earlier this summer but also gets at serious policy issues, which is that it, it, we need to develop a lot more renewable energy. And it's really hard to build things. Uh, it's hard to build things here in the United States, it's hard to build things in Europe. Um, also shout out to the photographer, Samuel Aranda, who is just an absolute master of the craft. and worked for the Times for years, uh, including on our Ola package that won the Pulitzer. Uh, and, and it's just one of the I mean, stunning photographs. Can you just go? I'm just going to ask Neil to go back to the byline yeah. because I saw something fairly unusual where it said that you traveled and spoke to these people right under that. Uh, I've not seen, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, this is something that the I forget, it's the audience team. Um, I and I forget, and there's been so much sort of movement on some of these teams, but this is an effort that you're seeing rolled out across more desks. And I think it's an effort that I think we did some internal research that suggested that. Um, bylines and datelines could be confusing to readers who weren't real aficionados of the paper, you know, who didn't have, if you haven't grown up in journalism and sort of aren't, don't know what the difference between a byline and a dateline and don't know, you know, who David Gellis is, I think there's an effort, especially as the Times reaches an ever larger number of readers and new readers to be as overt and explicit as we can about making clear who's telling this story. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like, who's the narrator? You know, who, who wrote this? What gives them the authority to write this? And where'd they do it? And so you're seeing, you're, I think, I think I forget, I think business has done some of it or maybe tech, um, climate is doing it. 
maybe sports. I, I forget exactly where, but you'll see. I, and I, I don't know if there's been an official decision to roll it out everywhere, but you're seeing it more and more. But I love it, and it it tells people the efforts that the time is at times, and you and others are making for this. Yeah. So that's great. So Here's my next climate story, which I'll I'll hopefully do. It's I, I wrote this version of it. Um, I mean, the, the my next climate story, which which will hopefully run. I don't know if it'll run next week, but the next week. But it's a big, deep investigative uh, research, you know, investigative piece, and it says, you know, David read more than 10,000 pages of emails to report, you know, and documents to report this story, which is what I've been doing <laughs> for the last month. If you haven't seen as many bylines, I've been reading tens of thousands of pages of documents. But again, it, it speaks to like the work that went into the story. Sure. Ken says, David, your words are so smart, tight and cogent. I can hardly focus enough to type this compliment. Inspiring. So thank you, uh, Ken, for watching. Folks, we've got to get to the paper itself. So we're going to do that right now. I'm going to pull up the New York Times and talk uh, about the paper and have David read it with us. So uh, please do follow David on Twitter. He's is is D Gellis, G-E-L-L-E-S. And uh, we'll uh, uh, get his opinions on what he's seeing here and any guidance that he can give us about uh, coverage and what he's seeing as well. So the lead is in Georgia case involving Trump, in Georgia case involving Trump cast broad net 2020 election inquiry. And then the big story here about the war, as uh, David mentioned, something that we'll be living it for decades to come. Uh, uh, women face public vitriol for testimony. And what is justice? One Parkland family's journey. This is about uh, the shooting uh, from 2018. Health, family, uh, health officials call emergency for monkeypox. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the coverage and the connection between public health stories like this and climate and where that's going? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have a smart answer to that specific question, but, but what I will say and just glance in at today's front page is, um, Many of those sort of big themes that I mentioned are, are right there. You've got global health on the front page. you got the fight for democracy in the Trump story. You've got the war. Um, and two, two democracy stories with the, 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 the piece by Maggie and another reporter about how women have been treated so unequally in the January 6th hearings. And then listen, the, the I, I, I haven't thought about it, but I would, you know, the, the the guns, I think there's there's a bucket sort of just which is like the, you know, the U.S. social fabric. And maybe that's a way to get at some of the issues around uh, racism and guns and drugs and inequality. You know, the, all of these are their own things, of course. But it, the the focus on the Parkland survivors, obviously, this is, this is a story that's tragically, you know, in the headlines every week right now, which is really frustrating. We're going into the paper and here's uh, here to help how to keep your pets cool during a heat wave. Um, as you know, the Times has evolved into doing these kinds of service journalism pieces. Uh, how do you think that those are being received and how does that fit into what's going on with the Internet and things like that? Uh, listen, I got into the news business um, because I liked how many different things it could do. I mean, I've always been of the mindset that a place like the Times, it, and you'll hear Dean and Joe say this all day long, right? Like one of our most essential public services is the kind of big investigative work that you see Michael Schwartz doing uh, in the war or you know, countless other reporters at the paper doing uh, over and over. Uh, and it's also the case that we provide so many other functions and we play so many other roles to our now, you know, I forget how many monthly average readers we have across all our platforms. I think we're well over 10 million now. And and so when I see something like how to keep your pets cool in the heat, I'm like, great. Like people, people need everything. And the more we can have like a diversity of offerings, the more we can be a part of our readers' lives. So I'm all for it. Here we're going through the uh, international section, a story about the killing of the former Japanese prime minister and its connection to the Unification Church, which, of course, Reverend Sung Young Myun, who uh, we know uh, owned the Washington Times and a place of great misinformation. Amid turmoil and civil unrest in Sri Lanka, cricket carries on and China Evergrande chief executive quits. 
This is uh, a new a latest setback for a property developer bogged down in debt. Yeah, Here's I mean, just, just just shout out to the Times for maintaining a massive international reporting force. We're one of the last few that actually does it. Um, and here are the benefits of it, right? And this is why subscribers matter. Just just like the subscriber drum. You know. Yeah, so everybody who subscribes to the Times or their local newspaper, you know, we encourage uh, everybody to subscribe to a newspaper, uh, whether digitally or in print. It makes a difference. Look at all this extensive coverage here of uh, Ukraine, where it sometimes feels like we don't discuss it enough, but the coverage is there. And this big monkeypox story becoming a global health emergency by WHO, only COVID and polio have those uh, markers right now, those, uh, that particular designation. Here's an unusual story. The Beagle Brigade guard airports against agricultural danger, sniffing out threats, a mango or sausage at a time. Officer charged in killing says he felt threatened. Here's, uh, these are national stories. And uh, a story about digital comics we we're seeing here as well. Mm -hmm. and, that, that started on the front. Yep. Yeah. And here's more about Parkland and uh, urgent questions about cancer care after Roe. And uh, a man admits backing Trump using wife's, <laughs> wife's ballot. Uh, uh, and uh, more stories from the front that are flash flooding in New Mexico follows fires claiming two lives. Talk a little bit about the heat wave and how you think about it at the climate desk as what, what's happening around the world. Yeah. Uh, obviously, extreme weather is becoming just a, a part of everyday news coverage. And I think we actually have a live briefing or a live blog on extreme weather that's being regularly updated now. I think I saw it on the front of the, the site and the app this morning, um, which is being you know regularly fed by correspondents and editors all over the world. And that's a recognition that uh, you know extreme weather is getting more extreme and is having more and more destructive impacts, not only on property and cities, but also on human lives. Um, we try to be very careful here in um, we try to be very judicious in following the science when attributing causality to extreme weather events when it comes to climate change. Um, and so you'll see, all, you know, I think we, we take it case by case, but we try to be pretty measured. And I think there are some things we can say, which is that on balance, I think the science is now clear that overall climate change and planetary warming uh, overall planetary warming that has been caused by emissions uh, from the burning of fossil fuels is on balance making weather more extreme and more volatile. That's very different than saying that a specific weather system or a specific weather event is caused by climate change. And so that's we're, we're always just trying to be very careful in not going too far, while also at the same time, uh, not losing sight of the fact that the science is now resoundingly clear and has been for, for a long time now that emissions from burning fossil fuels is heating the planet and making extreme weather more common and more destructive. Thank you. We're looking at the obit section. Tell us about your experience with obits. I've written a few obits. I, I mean, I almost said something weird, which is that I love it, which is... No, we've said that on the past. Thing. I know, which is such a sort of a macabre section. thing to say, but um, but there it is, right? I think we, we our, the Ovid's desk is is such a uh, a model of how to do it well and, and respectful and be respectful and celebrate lives. Um, so one of the coolest things, you remember the Overlooked series from a couple yes. of years ago? Yes, yes. I, I wrote one of those. Um, uh, about one of my first meditation teachers, which was really a, a, a really sweet and meaningful personal experience. So I wrote the uh, the overlooked about S. N. Goenka, who was a profoundly influential uh, meditation teacher, who's who's still you know uh, uh, maybe someone's pulling it up. There you go. Um, uh, who, and, and people still take his classes literally every day all over the world. 
And I was fortunate enough to study with him personally when he was still alive at the end of his life in India and sat with him in Igatpuri, India, just outside Mumbai uh, in January of 2021, uh, 2001, excuse me, um, and, and had the opportunity to meet him because the man who was my uh, origin, my first true meditation teacher was one of his best friends. And so I was able to go spend personal time with Manindraji in Yatpuri, which was uh, Goenka's primary meditation center. And, uh, and then I was very, very fortunate to write the overlook obituary for him when the time came. Amazing. We had Amy Padnani, who was editor of the series on uh, on the show. Uh, and we saw also the only obits was by Neil Genslinger, who's been a show multiple times, yeah. uh, a guest multiple times on our show. Here is the Sunday Styles cover, A Taste for Cannibalism. That's not a story you expect to see on a Sunday morning in the New York Times, but there it is. <laughs> Here's a, here's a, he's a guide in the shadows about the last movie rental clerk in New York. And the, I love these kinds of stories. And uh, he's the founder and sole employee of film noir cinema. And he appears to be the final movie rental clerk in New York. I like that New, yeah. they're, they're, they're saying that about him. Thoughts about the style section? I like, I love styles. <laughs> like, what, what, what can you say? Um, it's obviously had leadership changes over the past uh, couple years. So I think everyone's excited to see how Stella really makes it her own uh, and what that looks like. But I mean, like you can't not you can't open the paper and not read it and 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 confront it, <laughs> love it, hate it. Like I know it it elicits strong emotions across a wide range of populations. But yeah, you gotta love styles. Yeah, this this uh, modern love column is about a single 27 year old Muslim woman had never experienced any physical intimacy, and she talks about how she did, and that's getting a lot of attention, as you can imagine. In that column, right? That's like just the the uh, beyond the TV, the the you are the columns that really remain unchanged in format. Uh, and, and tone for so long. I think it's just a testament to sort of what a brilliant, um, uh, brilliant device modern love is. All right, I, we also love the Philip Glantz column, uh, social cues. So what I'm gonna do here is just read you a question. There's no right or wrong answer. And uh -oh. let's see what you have to say. By the way, uh, there was a nice comment there from Alfredo who uh, said, uh, Sri, thank you for featuring David today. A very informative conversation. And the question is, eyes on your own glasses. Uh, you may tell me to mind my own business, but my intentions are pure. My sister's fiance is a handsome guy, but his glasses are too small. The arms don't reach the back of his ears. It's an unflattering look. Should I say something to my sister? Yeah. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I, I don't, uh, come from the school of sort of, uh, uh, what's the right word? Like if I, if I have an opinion, I'll, let, I'll, I'll find a respectful way to let it be known. All right. So you don't keep it to yourself. So here's get in line. Many of us would love to tinker with the aesthetic choices of our friends and strangers. They are none of our business though, and we may hurt people's feelings. So unless you are asked for your opinion, limit your input to problems that can be solved on the spot. Spinach between teeth, for instance, or skirts hiked inadvertently into underpants. So uh, this... uh, my, my, my rebuttal would be there are uh, respectful and compassionate ways to share your advice uh, and, and that not everyone need take uh, suggestions for change as an insult. Uh, yep. And here's another way in which the Times has changed. Here's the School of the New York Times introducing online explorations, one week courses for grades 10 to 12. So lots of ways in which the Times is changing. Let's talk a little bit about this and tell us about your experience with LaGuardia, JFK and Newark. Uh, well, LaGuardia is better, I guess. It's still hard to get there or not as easy as it should be. I mean, what to say? Right? Like, if you fly in and out of New York, uh, and in and out of other cities, it's sometimes shocking how <laughs> uh, how poor our the greatest city in the world's infrastructure can be at times. The new Guardia terminal is great. It's also huge. It can take a long time to walk to uh, the, uh, the your lift or your taxi or whatever it might be. Yes, um, it's so far away, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. so for like, listen, 
it, it's travel. So you do it. <laughs> and this is uh, the 25 billion transfer, transformation of the three airports in the New York City area. And yeah. they're almost all hard to get to and get into the city and they're trying to do things. But I guess they're I, starting I just, by... I was just in and out of London, right? And Heathrow Express is like the fact that New York doesn't have I, some version of the Heathrow Express. Yes. From any of its three airports. It, it's just like, I don't know how we can be... Like, like the bar is very low if we're celebrate. Like, yes, it's better. And there's still a ton of work to do. And this is that wraparound that they have here. Look at this. It's uh, yeah. very dramatic in the print section. And it says, certainly LaGuardia, parts of Newark, and parts of JFK were just disgraces, says the executive director of the company that runs all of these, the Port Authority of New York. So uh, let's keep going. Sunday opinion cover is I was wrong. Uh, eight columnists, opinion columnists revisit their incorrect predictions. What are things that you, if you had a chance, would uh, be able to talk about being wrong? Ooh, that's a great one. I will say that in, I, you know, I wrote more than 100 corner office columns and I look back on some and feel like I missed the real story by not really pushing on how some of the CEOs I profiled were perpetuating Welchism, for a better word, right? And even even if I did ask some tough questions, I think a lot of the CEOs who I wrote about sort of were able to walk away and, and think about it as a PR win to be featured in that column. Um, and that that was that was a hard line I had to, to try to walk. I, I tried to do I tried to be serious and, and ask hard questions, but I think the the sort of the, the, the gravitational pull in that column was towards something that still had some of that flavor of sort of man being managerial and uh, optimistic. There it is, an optimist in the very first line. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and like, I think, right, the Panera one, I forget if I asked him about wages in that one. Um, I think I did, but, and I don't remember the detail, but like, I think they actually are paying okay wages for, for fast casual retail. But is it enough? I don't know. Right? This is it, 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 it's a part of the advanced problem like this. Yeah, I like how many uh, Indian CEOs you got there in the in, in that list right there. <laughs> including yeah. well, what, one of the things I did when I, I I made a bunch of dramatic changes to the column when I. Uh, Sort of reinvented it, Adam. After Adam Bryant, who of course originated the column, did an amazing job with it for ten years. Um, he left the paper. There were sort of no plans. I made a pitch to revive it. They accepted. And at the time, like when I did that, I did a bunch of big changes. We uh, added a reported introduction, which didn't exist previously. I really changed up uh, the style and the nature of the questions that I was asking the subjects. Uh, we added really great art. Um, which I, humbly I think wasn't all the way there before. We made it much longer. And then critically, I thought about who I was going to interview, and I, I decided I wanted a 50-50 split on men and women. And that automatically meant I was going to have to look well beyond the Fortune 100, uh, Fortune 500 even. And I also just decided, like, made the determination that there would be a, a good amount of diversity in the column. And I'm proud to say I, I more or less, I think, followed through on all of those ambitions. Uh, the column sort of ended rather abruptly. And I don't know, I think we were probably a little off on the 50-50 gender split, but we were pretty darn close. And we were, uh, you know, that there were times during my tenure where there had been more women than men, I believe. And and I think we I did, a, 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 I'm proud of the work I did in elevating overall a diverse set of leaders that i can say nice uh chris asks curious to learn did people pitch you on corner office or were you drawn to individuals who you interviewed i mean my i still get pitched on corner office and i've i stopped doing the column a long time ago <laughs> yeah i pitches are the bane of every reporter's inbox uh but i never i didn't accept pitches um maybe there's maybe there are a couple exceptions um, like if someone pitched, like if someone was going to pitch me like Jay-Z, I was going to do Jay-Z. I never did Jay-Z, but like there were a few ones like that where, um, 
it was an it was someone who was already on my list and then someone came and offered yes but all, like i would get i'm sorry like to all you pr professionals out there just have mercy <laughs> the amount of garbage that continue floods my inbox is uh it is not great <laughs> <laughs> and then the, I, the number of pitches I get from like a, you know a party planner in LA who was they wanted to put in corner off it's like get real come on and you, they're wasting time anyway I won't I won't go on my tirade against PR people uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yes I, yes there were pitches uh, yes maybe two or three. Uh, came from pitches, but those were people who were already on my meta list, which was hundreds of people long. And on balance, I chose all of them on the merits of people I was interested in talking to. Sure. Uh, this is the opinion section I'm just showing on the paper side here. North Carolina is both seductive and scary. Frank Bruni is now a professor at Duke, so he's writing, the state holds an illuminating and alarming political mirror. Ooh, I haven't read that. I want to read it. I always read Frank. Always good. And then I wanted to show you this op-ed, uh, not op-ed, sorry, an editorial. Yep. Uh, climate change is not negotiable. President Biden's best course is to take the same regulatory path Barack Obama was forced to follow. Uh, what does this kind of stand by the editorial board mean for the paper? And you folks are independent of that, the desk is. So can you talk about that? I think the, uh, the editorial page and the op-ed section in general has been, has been just as forceful on climate as the, the news report has been, which again I think speaks to not just the news but um, you know James and now Katie's commitment and and ultimately AG's commitment to climate change as a serious and enduring issue that demands full attention and resources of the uh, of the news organization as a whole. Sometimes I call it the paper. Sometimes I go, I call it the paper. And I was a uh, Meredith was uh, our CEO was interviewing me on stage recently, and I, I said, you know, the paper takes it really seriously. It's just like David, stop calling it the paper. But of course, when I say the paper, I mean you know the New York Times is a news organization. I got I got publicly reprimanded by our CEO for doing that recently. I'm trying to catch my gun. That's funny. Therese says, thank you, David, for spending the pandemic surfing issue, surfacing issues in corporate leadership that resonate today. Looking forward to more deep dives into climate by you and your team at the Times. We just have a few more minutes left with David, and we're just going to glance at the book review here. Dark Matter about uh, noir novels and thrillers. Uh, so interesting. And the New York Times Magazine cover. We talked about the future of democracy is how the movements to reinstate President Trump has, has how it's gone far beyond him and uh so interesting talk about the magazine a little bit please i mean jake has obviously elevated the magazine to just like an exceptional level and it just stays exceptional so uh and i don't know i don't know jake i've never written for the magazine or not not recently i wrote for as a freelancer before i joined the time as a staffer many years ago um but I mean, it's just sensational. And David Marchese, uh, his talk interviews, I think, are essential reads every week. Yeah, we we love reading all of these uh, features, but of course, the big stories are also so interesting. Oh, oh, Here. oh, right there. Tip. Okay, so okay, uh, permit me. So this is Malia Wallen's last tip column. Malia Wallen is uh, one of my good friends, full, full disclosure, but here's here's an interesting factoid. Malia Wallen, myself, Ben Hubbard, who's now our Beirut bureau chief, and a woman named Cindy Banu, who used to write for the science section. All four of us were in the same cohort of J200, which was the intro to journalism class in 2006 at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism that was taught by Lydia Chavez, who's a former Times bureau chief. And I will just point out that the fact that Four of Lydia's students in her one intro to reporting class in 2006 ultimately became essentially full time. At the Times, has to be some sort of you know record for uh, excellent uh, launching from from that one little cohort. So I I, I feel a d deep kinship and remain friends with both Malia, uh, Ben, and Cynthia. All three of us, we're all in touch. 
that's so cool. And this is her last call, last tip, as you said, uh, seven years of writing these in, in the in the paper. Are you a cook? I love cooking, and Times Cooking is obviously another amazing franchise. Um, Sam Sam's done a remarkable job with it, and he he. he I'll, I'll repeat some advice he gave me right when I joined the paper, um, which I reminded of him of recently when I saw him. Um, he was right when he was getting cooking off the ground. So maybe a little before he got cooking off the ground. But when I joined the paper, I was sort of asking, how do you make a career at the place? And he said it used to be the case that the Times was sort of one mountain and there was less and less room as you got to the top. Not dissimilar from a lot of other organizations, perhaps. And he said, but what was happening then, I think what is really clear now, just from our conversation over the last hour and a half, is that he said, it's become a mountain range where there's a lot of different peaks and you can find it, sort of find your spot and you can do a lot of different things over the course of a career and find different places where you can really have an impact. And he's done that obviously with cooking and now overseeing features coverage across the paper. You know, Jake obviously has a, a tremendous domain, but I think you've just seen it. Um, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of ways to have real impact at the paper these days. Yeah, we saw that also with our friend Monica Drake, who's been yeah. doing so many interesting and uh, and groundbreaking things at the Times. I did want to note that uh, Wall Street Journal Wine has an insert in the Times Magazine, which is really right, interesting right. What, what, and best what, in market offer for Sunday New York Times Magazine. This is not this is an ad made for this. Take the ad dollars all day. Yeah, it'll take it all, all the time. I, I believe the Times also has a wine club or did. I can't remember. Um, no what about puzzles? Uh, yeah, when I have time, I love doing puzzles. I've been playing a lot of chess lately. So, and I love the fact that we have this new online uh, chess puzzle. That made me really happy to see. Um, I, I am, for whatever reason, uh, I'm not, my brain is not wired to do advanced crossword puzzles. Um, so I always marvel at those who can sort of do the the friday or saturday puzzle uh you know in pen in under 10 minutes but that's not me and here is yeah the, the chess puzzles and the chess columnist too is that right yeah yeah which is great i love it i mean i, I play a lot of chess which is fun all right uh this is the uh this is the last couple of sections here arts and leisure the anti-hero's last gasp and real estate cover is sit down let's talk about this conversation pits make a resurgence this is where we come together and bond i guess this is like the living room is now yeah. called a conversation pit very cool i mean i i just speaks to the diversity of the stuff we do and i've written for almost every section in the paper i think i'm trying to think if there's a section i haven't written for i think i thought of one recently um but I, I may have checked it off my list. Maybe oh, I did that one too. I think I've written. <laughs> I think I've written for every section. Uh, cooking, maybe not yet. That may be the one. Yeah, which is. But I've written. Maybe it was food. I think I have not written for food. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, uh, folks. This is our guest, David Gellis. Uh, we are going to give him a little break so he can catch his breath. We're going to come back in two minutes and ask him to do uh, one more plug for his uh, book. We want to hear all about it. And then we're going to ask him for a pro tip, uh, something that writers and others can benefit uh, from knowing about. So David, we'll come right back to you. And uh, Neil's going to pop on here. and. There we go. Thank you, Sri. Appreciate it. Again, what a great show with, with David, covering such a broad range of topics. We have... Um, uh, we, we talked about his book, The uh, um, Man Who Broke Capitalism. Again, a great blurb. Um, this was from uh, Ari, uh, this one was from Ariana Anna Huffington. He wrote a book on meditation as well with a blurb from Mark Benioff. Uh, and he has written his corner office columns. And now if you haven't uh, seen them, his thread on Twitter is incredible. It's so great. David went back in January and and threaded over a hundred of his columns. I showed it on the screen while we were talking to David. I, as you know, I'm a big fan of threads. I thought it was incredible. Puts everything in one place, makes it easy to read. Hats off, David, uh, to you uh, for that. And again, we talked about his meditation work as well and his writing for the Times, the meditation guides, etc. 
So before we bring Sri back on, let's just do another quick shout out to our team. Uh, of course, Sri is our host. I'm the executive producer. Paula Kiger is uh, engaging with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. We always appreciate um, uh, her work with that. It makes a big difference. It really is the gold standard in terms of how to do a live stream, how to interact with uh, folks, dropping in links to uh, uh, comments, et cetera, links to articles. We want to thank our sponsor, Muckrack, uh, for their longtime support of the Read Along and uh, several other projects that Sri has been involved in. And of course, the show is produced by Digimentors. That's the uh, consulting group that Sri co founded with his uh, longtime digital mentor, Andrew Lee, um, and, uh, and of course, Rupa as well, his, his wife. Uh, we do virtual and hybrid events, social and digital consulting and a lot more. Um, please feel free to get in touch with us um, if you have uh, uh, any anything we can work on. We want to give a shout out to the Local Connection Newsletter. The Center for Corporate Media at Montclair State University brings you the Local Connection Newsletter each week. Uh, it offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. Best of all, it's free. You can subscribe at bit.ly. Uh, slash local news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. And our last announcement before bringing David back on, our good friend Rose Horowitz has another Women to Follow show coming up on Tuesday, July 26th, this Tuesday. Wall Street Entrepreneur meets NFT Marketplace and Blockchain, a uh, interview with Jenny QTA. So look forward to that Tuesday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. And um, you definitely should follow Rose on all of her channels. So with that, we'll bring back uh, Sri. And right away, we're going to bring back David Gellis because we have a special guest on the show. David, who's joining us? Who, who are you? Clark This Gellis. is Clark Gellis. Hi, Wait, Clark Gellis. Wait, is this on the internet? <laughs> it is on, on the, the internet. internet. You're live. And you're li you can say hi to people. Can you say hi to everyone? I wonder if Alex is watching. <laughs> he wonders if his best friend is watching. All right. Bye, bud. I'll see you in a second. <laughs> you'll get, you'll get that back in just a minute. Yeah. So thank you, David. What a great show. We learned so much. I learned so much. I know our audience did as well. So thank I want you. to do two things with you. One is to have you talk a little bit about the book one more time. Uh, tell us about the book again. Hold up that book jacket and why people should get this. Okay. Well, and and with with all, I'm so grateful. But one thing that I don't think we've mentioned is that this book debuted on the New York Times bestseller list okay. and has been sitting on the monthly Times bestseller list for almost two months now. So uh, it has sparked a conversation. People want to talk about these issues. And it has uh, just been so gratifying that the message has been heard and uh, it's been awesome. The reception has been great. The book is about Jack Welch, but more broadly uh, and more than just one man, it's about the world of shareholder primacy we live in, the deeply unequal way in which corporations and executives treat the American public and how it is we can start making progress in undoing some of these inequities. That's the book. Please check it out. If you haven't already, I would really, really appreciate an offer. Uh, an order, excuse me, is what makes it possible for me to continue doing this work. So thank you all. Well, thank you. And thank you for writing that book. It's, it's so important and so timely. I asked you earlier if you had gotten any pushback from the all the fanboys and fangirls, and you said? Uh, less than I perhaps expected. I mean, definitely some. Welch has his defenders out there. but And, and Jeff Immelt, Jack Welch's successor, handpicked successor, wrote a piece about it on LinkedIn, to which I promptly replied mm -hmm. uh, in pretty sharp terms. But what I haven't seen is someone really stand up and, and, and decide that they were going to take the other side of the debate, that they were going to be willing to get up there and talk about why shareholder primacy and mistreating workers and spending money on shareholders and investors to the expense of all other considerations, which is the world we still live in today, is the right way to do things. No one's, no one's making that argument today, which I think is yet more evidence that that moment has hopefully passed and that we need a new model of, of capitalism in the world today. 
So I guess Fox Business hasn't done their segment praising. <laughs> uh, Marie, I'm waiting for the invite to have Maria uh, have me on her show, and I can I'll debate it with Bob Nardelli, who's a frequent guest of hers. Sure. And Therese is asking about Audible versions of the book. Yeah, it's available on Audible. Uh, it, that's a great way to to check it out as well. But David, right. did you did you do the uh, narration on Audible? Yeah. Because you I, actually I read there's a, there's a whole universe of sort of private book narrators. Um, yeah. Who, who tend to get things like this? Uh, but on I, this, I, I, I am not a well enough known quantity, a la David Sedaris or Malcolm Gladwell, where people know my voice. So maybe when that happens. However, yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing this out. I want to point um, this out. The Times is doing more. It uh, is asking readers, uh, excuse me, asking reporters to narrate some sort of signature pieces. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to narrate the first serial which uh, went up a couple weeks ago. And it was it's available both on the New York Times audio app, which is still in beta, but which I have access to. <laughs> um, and, and some people on this call may. Uh, and also on Autumn, A-U-D-M, which is another very popular podcasting and audio journalism app. Um, and it was great. It got sort of another life uh, there. And it's, of course, available on the article page of the first serial. Yeah. And it's and that is me reading it, which was a lot of fun. I hadn't done it before. I will I will never listen to myself do race on my own voice. Uh, I'll never rewatch this with all respect, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, however, I found this to be sort of a different format and and really quite fun. Great. Well, before we leave you, uh, we were hoping you could give us a pro tip uh, for for writers. Um, so, what what advice would you have uh, for writers? Yeah, for writers and especially for nonfiction writers, my advice is to for nonfiction writers to read more fiction. Um, fiction writers, novelists in particular, really focus on language and sort of the cadence and the lyricism of prose in a way that I think can often get lost. And I just I have always had sort of a very musical approach to writing where I sort of it, the way it sounds it coming off my tongue and in my head really matters. And I think it helps keeps readers engaged. And it's a great opportunity to like integrate new words into your vocabulary, but more so just make the the prose sort of sing as much as it can. So it's something I try to focus on and, and bring to life. And I don't always accomplish it, but even in sort of investigative work, there's the opportunity to make the writing sing. And I think it's just, it's a service to the readers and we can do it. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Again, our guest uh, today has been David Gellis, a New York Times climate reporter uh, who wrote a book about Jack Welch, the man who broke capitalism. He also has a background writing the corner office column and uh, several pieces on meditation. Uh, just as a programming note, and we ran it underneath um, earlier in the show, we're going to be taking the next two weeks off for a summer break, uh, but we will be back on August 14th. Uh, with uh, Don Yeager, who is a uh, New York Times bestselling author and a former uh, associate editor of Sports Illustrated. So uh, look for us on August 14th, Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, again, David, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. And for folks who are maybe joined us late, as soon as we finish, you'll be able to watch the show on all the same links, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website uh, just shortly after we are done. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, David.